Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience as we had um, some technical difficulties. Welcome, welcome to tonight's program, a conversation between Glenn Frankel and Charles Kaiser about Frankel's new book, Shooting Midnight Cowboy, Art, Sex, Loneliness, Liberation, and the Making of a Dark Classic. My name is Marsha Eli. I'm the Director of Programs at the Center for Brooklyn History. I read this book and I followed it by watching the film again. And the combined experience was one of the most transporting I have had during this long year. Um, I just wanted to tell you all that. Um, I'm very excited for this discussion that we're about to hear. Uh, and wanna say just a quick word about the Center for Brooklyn History first. We are a proud part of the Brooklyn Public Library. We hold the world's most extensive collection of Brooklyn related materials. We bring education programs to classrooms across the city. Soon we'll be mounting exhibitions again. And every week we have free public programs like this one through the library's programming arm BPL Presents. I wanna mention one in particular in a few weeks, we'll be talking about technology, society, and our uncertain future with the brilliant Kevin Roos, the technology columnist for the New York Times, and Ethan Zuckerman, another brilliant visionary uh, and thinker on digital infrastructure and social change. Um, BPL presents, curates concerts, family programs, book talks, much, much more. Please visit Brooklyn Public Library's website find BPL Presents and see what's coming up. So before I disappear, I want to share two final notes. First, if you wanna purchase the book, we will be putting a link in the chat for you to do so locally at the community bookstore in Park Slope in support of Brooklyn's local businesses. And second, I, I wanna invite all of you to share your questions. Just type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's conversationalists and tell you a little bit about who they are. Glenn Frankel is the best-selling author of The Searchers and High Noon. His latest book is Shooting Midnight Cowboy. He worked for many years at the Washington Post, winning a Pulitzer Prize in 1989. He has taught journalism at Stanford University and the University of Texas at Austin, where he directed the School of Journalism. He has won a National Jewish Book Award, was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize, and is a Motion Picture Academy Film Scholar. Charles Kaiser is the author of 1968 in America, The Cost of Courage, and The Gay Metropolis, The Landmark History of Gay Life in America. He is a book critic for The Guardian, has been a press critic for Newsweek uh, and a reporter for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. His work has appeared in the Washington Post, the LA Times, Vanity Fair, and many, many other publications. And in 2015, he was inducted into the LGBT Journalist Hall of Fame. Welcome, Charles. Welcome, Glenn. Thank you both so much for being here. Take it away. Thank you so much, Marcia, and thank you for organizing this wonderful event. I've done a lot of these, but there's never been one that I've looked forward to more than interviewing Glenn Frankel about his fantastically good new book about Midnight Cowboy. Uh, one of the things I think we should explain, Glenn, is that uh, the success of an enterprise like this depends a lot on the good luck of the researcher. And it seems to me that considering the fact that you were writing about something which happened more than 50 years ago, you had extremely good luck in finding people who were alive, who were important to this movie. Could you give us a brief list of the living major figures connected to the movie who you were able to interview yourself? I can't hear you, Glenn. All right, now, there you go. now I can. I'm unmuted. You're right, I was extraordinarily lucky to find so many people from a movie that was filmed 53 years ago, came out 52 years ago. 
people like Ann Roth say, the wonderful costume designer who is now 89 and incidentally has just been nominated for yet another Academy mm -hmm. Award for her costume designs for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. I mean, Ann invited me to her farmhouse in Eastern Pennsylvania, made me a lovely omelet and talked to me for several hours about dressing John Voight and Dustin Hoffman and designing their costume. And his suitcase. <laughs> and the suitcase. And for that matter, Void and Hoffman. They weren't the easiest people in the world to get, um, but gradually they each of them agreed separately to meet with me. And it was it was wonderful to talk to them about the thing with all these folks who are still around, they understand and consider Midnight Cowboy one of the heights of their careers, uh, when they were really challenged, when they had opportunities. Jerry Hellman, the producer, um, was is very proud of this film, uh, talked about it. And even in cases where people had passed away, like the great Marion Doherty, the casting director, who I didn't know anything about really until I started doing the research, but it was such a key element, both in getting Voight and Hoffman these roles in the movie, but also the superb supporting cast, uh, Sylvia Miles, you know, and Brenda Vaccaro and many others. I mean, uh, Marion had passed away, but Julia Taylor, who was Marion's assistant, who started working for her just out of Smith College when they started making the movie. Julia was very happy to talk to me about her boss and what a, what a smart, important person she was in all this. And Jennifer Salt, who had her first acting role in the movie, was happy to talk to me not only about her own involvement in it, but about her father, Waldo Salt, the screenwriter who won the the best adapted screenplay Oscar. So you know how it is, you're a journalist, you go and you try to find everybody you can. If you can't find them, you try to find the next best thing. And, and it wasn't just I was able to find these people, they are so interesting. They are so interesting that this crowd of people, many of them come to New York to find themselves, to find their future, they struggle uh, and they get involved in this movie and it really is the high point in their careers for many of them, uh, that makes it very easy for someone like me to waltz along at this point and say, well, tell me about it. And they were, for the most part, very happy to do so. What are the biggest differences between the novel uh, that the, the movie is based on and the movie itself? Is, uh, are there more hints that uh, the main protagonist is gay in the novel, for example, than there are in the movie? You know, it's very similar in a way um, the, movie, the, the novel is written by James Leo Hurley, who was in his private life an exuberant gay man, very handsome man. He was an actor, he was a playwright, uh, and he was a novelist. And this novel, he writes this novel in the mid 60s and it comes out in 65. The first half of the novel takes place in Texas and it's a sort of straight narrative of, of the life of Joe Buck, a very isolated, lonely figure, abandoned by his mother, raised by his grandmother. Um, and, and we get to understand, and he has experiences, including sexual experiences, both gay and straight. And Joe, uh, you know, it's hard to typecast him as either gay or straight. He's just a kind of lost soul looking to connect to the world somehow and, and, and finding it very difficult, um, taking love where he can find it, being used by, by folks both straight and gay because he's a very handsome guy, very naive guy in some ways. I think the movie captures that rather well. It's interesting in that uh, Jim Hurley, the novelist, as I said, was an exuberant gay man. And John Schlesinger, the film director uh, who takes over the novel and turns it into the film is also an exuberant gay man, but this is the sixties. They're both in the closet publicly. Jim does- as, as is, we should point out for our audience, as is, 99% of the gay men in America <laughs> and women are all in the closet in the 1960s. Absolutely, it's against the law. We should remind people of. Sodomy is against the law in 49 states. Right. Uh, even when this movie's made. And so Jim Hurley, he says, I'm not writing a gay novel. That's what he says publicly. And John Schlesinger says, I'm not making a gay movie. But the subtext and the, you know, uh, and, and the scenes and especially, and even the sexuality of the movie is such that this is more than subcontext. I mean, this this is there. Hurley is writing about for the first time in his career openly gay people, um, mm -hmm. and writing about them in interesting ways. And John Schlesinger, of course, has already made Darling, where he's had uh, one gay character very openly so, and, and treated like an adult rather than like uh, a, either a victim or someone who's 
going to die of his sexuality. Which was traditionally the, uh, the ne necessary outcome for every gay character. Absolutely. Kind of a bad ending. Yeah, no, it was, it was it's like smoking cigarettes. They should have put a sign up saying, you know, homosexuality is dangerous to your health in movies. They all die, it seems, in, in, in Hollywood until John Schlesinger and some other folks come along and begin to do different things with it. So, yes, all that's going on. But but in both cases, the sexuality is not, you know, is it, it, part of the movie, an important part. And we see it just like we saw it in the novel. Schlesinger's arc on this question is uh, interesting because, as you say, he has the first openly gay character in Darling, and then he has really two extremely unattractive gay characters in Midnight Cowboy, and then he goes on to make Sunday Bloody Sunday, which is really one of my favorite movies of all time, and is the kind of crucial movie in the birth of gay liberation because it has this first attractive on-scene uh, kiss between two gay men. But he seems to have kind of gone back and forth among these three movies as to how he would portray gay people. I think he's evolving in terms of his art. I also, he, he thought of Sunday Bloody Sunday as his most personal movie. Uh, having, having had great success with Darling and then having surprised a lot of people, including himself, with having great success with Midnight Cowboy. And when I say great success, I don't mean just that he made a wonderful movie, but it was a movie that got very good reviews and it did very well at the box office that Schlesinger becomes more and more emboldened, if you will, A, to do whatever he, the hell he wants to do, and B, to become more personal and more intimate. And so Sunday Bloody, Sunday, Bloody Sunday is, is, is a big step in that direction. And I think in many ways, the most groundbreaking of all these films. Yes. Uh, ironically, of course, or maybe not so ironically, it's the one that, doesn't, that does the least well at the box office. But it's a wonderful movie and, uh, you know, uh, not seen as much as it should be or talked about as much as it should be at this point. Now, this book is the third of a trilogy. Did you know what the, the three movies would be when you wrote the first book or did you pick each of them individually as you went along? I just stumbled along, Charles. <laughs> I, you know, it's a long story, but I get back and, you know, I, I leave the Washington Post. I start teaching journalism at Stanford and I have time to write books and I want to do an American book. And I decide to do my favorite uh, American movie, which is The Searchers, John Ford's film starring John Wayne. I had no idea, for example, when I stumbled along thinking this will be fun, I'll go to Monument Valley. I'll write about Wayne and Ford, two interesting people. But what I found out about three days in doing heavy research. The research I did was I bought the 50th anniversary edition of the DVD and there in the documentary, <laughs> um, it says, this is loosely based on a true story about a nine-year-old girl kidnapped by Comanches in Texas. So suddenly out of nowhere, I wasn't just potentially doing a making of the movie book. I was doing a book that involved a frontier legend, a myth, if you will, and how and and how that myth evolved in retelling by every generation, and and to fit their own sensibility and their own needs. And suddenly, I was in something uh, much deeper and harder to do, but also something that appealed to me very much. It was like unlocking the door. That one worked out very well in the end. I stumbled into High Noon. Um, because there the, the, the historical context was very clear from the beginning, the Hollywood blacklist and the Red Scare, and the fact that the screenplay writer Carl Foreman was called to testify before the House on American Activities Committee while they were in the film shoot. So there we were in very much contemporary ground between the, the movie and, and the, the history. So you did the blacklist twice in the current book and the previous book. You had to do the history of the Hollywood blacklist, correct? Yes, well, well but much more intensely in the first one. Midnight Cowboy um, came to me early, the idea. Um, I mean, normally, if you're going to do those two Westerns, Searchers and... Uh, I knew you're going to end up doing Shane as your third one, right? The other 1950s classic Western, but Shane didn't really speak to me in terms of the historical context, which as you, as you know, is a sort of half of what I'm doing. I'm, I, I found that movies, uh, again, stumbled upon the fact that movies are a wonderful looking glass into the era they are made. They tell you so much. Um, you can read history books, 
Um, you can look at the old newspapers, you can talk to people, but a movie really gives you an insight into the era it reflects. And the era it reflects give you, <laughs> gives you a lot of insight into the movie. So there I was. I knew with Midnight Cowboy because it was shot in 1968 in New York, in a New York that's beginning to deteriorate in many ways and face a big crisis. Hollywood is facing a large crisis. Uh, uh, the pop culture is changing. Meanwhile, as, as you've written about very, so beautifully in the 1968 book, the country is having a sort of collective nervous breakdown. As, uh, they're, as they're shooting it, the whole world is falling apart. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so I knew I was in rich territory, but you know what I was going to do, how selective I could be or wanted to be, how I was going to take all this in. I mean, it, it turned out to be, of course, as they always are, much more complex to do. But at the same time, I had this wonderful movie. I had these fascinating people. I was there <laughs> with something I could that could help me waltz through the minefield of the whole story. So I, I chose foolishly and wisely at the same time to take on Midnight Cowboy. Well, the cultural histories that you do of the 1960s in Great Britain and America are two of the great, of the many joys of reading your book. How old were you when you saw Midnight Cowboy and do you remember how it affected you? Well, I was 19. Um, and I was a sophomore at Columbia University, uh, finishing, actually just finishing my sophomore year when the movie came out. Did you see it at Woolman Auditorium? I think I saw it at Woolman Auditorium in 1969 when it came out. I think I saw it in Roch, you know, I, I think I saw it over the summer in New York uh, and then saw it again. And then I ended up, you don't need my long bio, personal biography, but I ended up in Israel in the summer of 1970 working on a kibbutz. Um, and my girlfriend came and we went hitchhiking at the end of this time of working on kibbutz. And we ended up seeing the movie in a little busted up theater in Israel with a bunch of Israelis who were munching on sunflower seeds all the way through. Half the screen was subtitles in French, Arabic and Hebrew. You could barely make it out. So I have a long history with this movie and, uh, and, and loved it from the first, partly because of Dustin Hoffman of all things. Um, he was such a counterculture hero and icon after the graduate it was right, right. you know we all loved him we all yeah loved him. and we love the fact that this little short guy you know had become a big movie star you know he, he broke so many molds and then he broke another mold by taking on the part of ratso rizzo this sort of outcast con man you know disabled con man from the bronx such a different role than the benjamin braddock clean cut you know, college graduate. And how much, how much was, I think he got $25,000 for the graduate. Does that sound right? That sounds about right. And yeah. What did he get? What did, what did he and Voight get each get for uh, Midnight Cowboy? Well, Voight got 17.5. He got wow. nothing. But Hoffman, <laughs> they offered Hoffman, I think, as I'm recalling now, 75 or 80. And he said, I really want to do this movie. Ask him for double. Ask him if they'll double it. And they did. So Hoffman made about 150, as I recall. Uh, but he really wanted to be the character actor. You know, Hoffman had never expected to be a movie star. He, he had gone through the theater. He believed in theater. He wanted to show people he wasn't just this little clean cut kid that Mike Nichols had manipulated, you know, in, in The Graduate. And so this was a challenge for him. And it made him, he was already, as I say, a cultural icon to us a counterculture icon. And this movie really cinched it because there he was really acting his pants off all through this movie. And, um, and he was fabulous in it. And so I think that had a lot to do with its sudden success and with its popularity with people like me and like you. You uh, naturally, as the great reporter you are, you discovered that many of the most famous things about the movie were not true. The myths about the movie. Let's talk a little bit about the rating from an X to an R and what really happened? People used people thought that United Artists had begged it to become an R, which and eventually succeeded after it won Best Picture. But tell us what actually happened. Well, this is interesting because it's so relevant to the to the theme of homophobia and, and to the way homosexuality was viewed, even in liberal New York in the 1960s. Um, 
originally the, the, the context is the old censorship system called the production code had been scrapped by Hollywood. The studios were actually looking to find ways to attract younger audiences with money, the baby boomer generation. And so they installed a rating system that was designed to make it easier to do more complex uh, adult movies. And, and kiss on the lips for more than three seconds, which I believe was prohibited until then. It was not only that. I mean, you could you couldn't depict a married couple in bed together. Never mind <laughs> kissing or doing anything. It, it, you know, so that they got rid of that. They put in the rating system. Midnight Cowboys, one of the first movies to get rated. And uh, what I found out is that it wasn't originally rated X. It was rated R by the ratings board, which uh, had questions about the sexuality in the movie. Both the gay sex and the straight sex is very transactional and cold and. But, but they, they recognized the quality of the movie and they said, oh, we'll rate it R, that's good enough. But then, and United Artists, the people who financed this movie really thought it was a, a, a good movie too. They didn't expect it was going to make a dime, but never mind. They'd gotten it for a relatively low price. But Arthur Krim, the head of United Artists, a great citizen of um, Hollywood and New York, he was nervous about the sexuality in the movie and specifically about the gay scenes. And he took, he took a print of this film and showed it to a distinguished uh, psychoanalyst at Columbia University Hospital who agreed with him that this p movie could have a deleterious effect on young men. It could cause people like me and you to become gay uh, somehow. That somehow, was, which as I pointed out in my review, I thought the only thing that could have caused anybody to become gay from this movie were the shots of John Voight's naked body. Certainly not <laughs> the portrayals of the gay characters in the movie. Well, but you know, uh, you know, the Freudians were running the show in New York. Um, everyone with money was going to seem to be in psychoanalysis. It was like a like a nightmare Woody Allen movie, and and this conventional Freudian wisdom was that gay people were made, not born in any it way. Was and the they were greatest uh, medical malpractice on the largest scale in the history of the universe. Well, the people who were forced to pay psychiatrists to try to become straight. Exactly. And it was, you know, fascinating for me to delve into all this. And again, it was relevant in part because this is how the movie ended up being rated X. Well, Arthur Krim rated it X himself. He didn't tell anybody he did that. People assumed that the ratings board was full of prudes who decided they were going to rate it X themselves. The ratings board gets got slapped around by critics who said, you know, this is terrible. United Artists actually figured out a way to use the X rating to market Midnight Cowboy. One of the, you know, the things they put up was whatever you've heard about Midnight right. Cowboy is true. Yeah. And that attract again, attracted us to the movie. I mean, an X rating was became a come on, at least sure. in New York and in the larger cities. After the, but then the movie is nominated for Best Picture and not only the first uh, X rated movie to be nominated and then it wins Best Picture, the only X rated only movie to win. Incredible. Then suddenly Arthur Krim and company want to get it back to R because they can open in many more theaters that way. Uh, and they go back to the ratings board and the ratings and, and somehow the story gets out. I, I don't know how to tell you this, Charles, but a lot of these Hollywood stories turn out to be not totally true. <laughs> and this I knew Arthur Krim because he was like my father, a great Democrat. My father worked for every Democratic president from Truman through Carter. And Arthur, of course, as you say in the book, was very close to both Jack Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. But I have to tell you one story because I used to go over there when my father was in town. He used to take me as his date to dinner at the Crims, who lived in a huge, beautiful, double-sized townhouse on the east side. And of course, one of the main sources of uh, United Artists' success was that they had the James Bond franchise. But his wife, Mathilde Krim, the great scientist and founder of Amphar, was not a fan, was a snob, and did not like James Bond movies at all. And she said this one night at dinner, I don't really like James Bond. And Arthur turned to her and said, motioned to the glory that we were sitting in this house and said, but darling, all this. <laughs> exactly. Well, Arthur Krim was a smart guy and- uh, Wonderful guy. They went back and they re and they asked it to be dropped to R. The board did that, but the board again got no credit. The, the, the story that went around is that the, the board begged them to just take a single frame out of the movie so that they could re set, claim that it had been toned down and they could re-rate it. That's totally untrue, but it's the story that sort of has come down through the ages. 
uh, it wasn't hard that hard to track down the, the true story. And as again, it because it fits so well with with so many things I was writing about. It's just another example of of how homosexuality was treated and how much fear there was that somehow this thing, based on no evidence, you know, no actual scientific <laughs> data whatsoever. Uh, the guy our, uh, Aaron Stern, who who advised Arthur Krim on this. He was so articulate and so uh, charming in his way that after that, Jack Valenti made him the chairman of the ratings board for several yeah, years. Uh, and, and then realized that it was a mistake. And realized yeah. it was a tragic error on his part. But we moved on from there. But I love that, you know, it was a really interesting account of what really happened. And it's always nice to get one of those in your book. Um, as a gay historian, I was genuinely impressed how much new gay history I read in your own book. Uh, and including the Philip Roth piece, which I have to admit I had never seen or read before. Tell us a little bit about Philip Roth's view of homosexuality in, of all places, the New York Review of Books. Well, there you are, a great liberal, um, a great novelist, writing in the great liberal journal of New York. Um, you know, in, the Bible. About 1965, what was it? And he's writing about Tiny Alice, the Albee play. Uh, right. After Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And he basically skewers it as a gay play hiding a dishonest play because Albee's hiding the fact that it's really about gay people. This was a theme not only with Philip Roth incidentally, but there's a famous Stanley Kaufman piece, as you know, in the, you know, in the New York Times that says, why are these people hiding? Stanley's piece is a little more sympathetic in a way he's saying they have to hide. And he doesn't name three gay playwrights, but he's talking about Albee and Tennessee Williams and William Inge. But this theme that somehow, you know, this gay mob. Why, why won't gay people just write about real gay characters? Well, it had an unintended uh, great benefit for us because Mark Crowley was sitting at home on a Sunday morning and he wrote that Stanley, read that Stanley Kaufman piece and said to himself, well, I can write a gay play about real gay characters. And of course, the result was the boys in the band. And you interviewed Mart as well, didn't you? I did. I got Mart on the phone. He talked for two hours. He was he was fantastic. A wonderful man. I loved Mart. Wonderful man. Well, I got all that over the phone. He was just a lovely guy. We made a, you know, we even agreed we would meet again. And of course, that never happened. Mart has passed away now. But Mart, you know, Mart saw Stanley's uh, piece as a challenge. And, and yes, Mart was yes. looking to do something. And, and so he said, well, I can do that. And and Damn it, he did it. And, and that's part of, we're talking about 1968 when the boys in the band come out. The, the, you know, the, the icebergs are shifting. Yes, but let's, let's recall what, what uh, Mart's agent said to him when he sent this play to his agent. She said, I can't send this around. This is like a weekend on Fire Island. <laughs> well, exactly. Uh, um, but but things are changing. Things are moving. I mean, Midnight Cowboy premieres in May 1969 and one month before Stonewall. Right. Um, so popular culture is is exploding in many ways. Um, sexual themes of all kind are of all kinds are moving up. Philip Roth is writing Portnoy's Complaint at that time, and it comes out. They're, 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 and that was fast, just a fascinating moment to look at these things. And also, again, for Schlesinger, who wants to do this kind of movie and who wants to be as frank as he decides to be about sexuality and about other things, he uses this to his advantage to make the kind of movie he wants to make. Is Schlesinger's lover still alive? He is, he is. He, was he important to you in your researches? He was incredibly helpful. He's, a, 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 I would say, one of the guardians of Schlesinger's legacy. Um, he loved, he met Schlesinger just before um, John, well, John was right, starting to work on the script with Waldo Salt. They meet out in, in the West Coast. They meet cute, you know, on a sort of blind date. Um, they fall for each other. He's, he's, he was much younger than John Schlesinger in, a, in UCLA film school at the time. Uh, comes to New York with John, helps, he's a photographer, Michael, and, and, helps with this, also becomes John's sort of envoy to different parts of New York culture, uh, for example, the Warhol crowd. And Michael is, um, you know, still understands how important this is, is a great champion of it, took wonderful, still, you know, intimate still photos, which he you know, allowed me permission to use in the book. I, 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 it couldn't have been anywhere near the book it was without Michael's help. I would, don't you say that on the set that the, the, the crew, Schlesinger was immune to the, 
homophobia of the crew, but his boyfriend was not. Didn't they sort of take it out on the boyfriend, the things that they didn't do to Schlesinger? Am I remembering this right? Yeah, that's exactly right. He was a handsome young guy and vulnerable. He was the assistant to the director, which incidentally, Jerry Hellman, the producer, had totally thought was a great idea to have somebody there with John who, who John loved. Because John was an up and down guy for all his skills and for everything he brought to this film. And he, every, almost everyone I talked to who worked on it with him loved him, but at the same time, he was up and down all the time and talking about, oh, will anybody come see this piece of crap? You know, why would anybody see this? He had to be talked down constantly and Michael was very good at that. The crew was, uh, uncomfortable at times, not only with the homosexuality, but some of the other parts of the movie. Um, they were, you know, very different cultures than this British guy who'd showed up. It was a complicated shoot. John Schlesinger said it was, you know, the worst shoot of his life in some ways. And yet at the same time, he's working with all these wonderful people. He knows they're good. They know he's good. And, and it's a great collaboration. So you know, writing about both the pluses and minuses of that was really interesting for me. We're both recovering journalists who've become cultural historians. And I went, I'm, to me, it's become much more satisfying right from the start to write in long form as a book writer than I ever had as a journalist. But you had a much more exciting and successful career as a journalist than I ever did. But do you, which one, do you prefer one to the other or have you enjoyed both of them equally? Yeah, I've given that some thought lately, <laughs> and I, I all I can say is, it, it, you know, if I hadn't had the journalism career that I'd had and worked at the Washington Post for so many years, and I was a foreign correspondent for 14 years, I don't think I would have the knowledge and the, and the skills to try to take these things on. Oh yeah, it's a great training ground for sure. Yeah. It is. I mean, you managed to write The Gay Metropolis without having been in, you know, in the newspaper business all that long. And that is a fabulous book, frankly. And I relied so much on that. that that's, you know, that's just a great work. And I don't see any of my books being at quite that level but I'm very oh, proud. I disagree. The new one is absolutely at that level. I disagree. But go ahead. Well, we, we, we'll argue about that over a drink sometime. But, you know, I, I, this works very well for me now. I mean, Charles, I, I write a proposal and, you know, get some money, not huge advance, but enough money to do the project. Then the publishing house I, it leaves me alone. They know, you know, and for years sometimes, I mean, I'm on my own, which at this stage in my life is probably, as my wife would say, an excellent idea that I'd be on my own on these things. And uh, so I'm, I'm just thoroughly enjoying it, but I'm very grateful for having been at the Washington Post. It was, you know, it was the hot book for all those years and it's now the hot book again in many yeah, ways. Yeah. And I'm proud of my alma mater. And we should point out that your editor is Colin Dickerman, who is uh, the editor of three of the best books that I've reviewed in the last year, The Memoirs of John Giorno, uh, the biography of uh, Frank Kameny, and your own. Uh, what is the uh, role of a good editor in the, your book writing process? Well, when you start out, you sit down and you talk, and, and Colin raised my horizons quite a bit then, and also introduced me to several people and sent me your way, for example. So he helps you get started. At this stage in my life, you know, as I say, then I take it from there. But then he's, he's you know, he was very good at weeding out some of those extra metaphors that didn't belong and suggesting that the, my own chapter five, which is called by, for some reason, the gay metropolis, uh, <laughs> was that. <laughs> perhaps a bit too long. And, uh, you know, that sort of thing. He, he was very helpful. It's very helpful to have a second set of eyes, especially someone who knows the world and knows New York uh and those gay history as well as colin did but you know I, he was there to look over my shoulder but it was so it was the best kind of editing really uh we have a few questions from the audience and here's the first one from dean i can't wait to read this book i'd love to know how the factory people like viva ultraviolet and taylor mead who else ended up getting cast for in the party scene do we know how they got cast into that party scene? Yes, we do. Well, you know, in the novel, there is a party scene uh, from about, you know, would have been a 1960s style beatnik party. There are bongo drums. There are two men dancing together and that's outrageous. 
there's there's turtlenecks and some kind of uh, you know uh, methamphetamine and that's it. By the time Midnight Cowboy comes around to be filmed in the late 60s, the party scene has changed a little bit in Greenwich Village. And my again, Michael Childers, who was 24 years old and a handsome devil and a great photographer, he makes it his business to get to know the Warhol crowd. He's doing that in part for John. Waldo Salt also knew the War, Warhol, Warhol crowd. Waldo Salt never went, you know, never avoided a party he could go to. And so they talked John into looking at doing something with Warhol. Warhol didn't want to be in the movie. He didn't want to be in something he couldn't control, but he was open to giving them carte blanche with the superstars. Uh, and Viva, who's one of the actress, actors who I, you know, who had the, the chops and the looks to potentially be in mainstream movies, and I think had some interest in that, she got involved in it early on. And Paul Morrissey, who was, you know, uh, Warhol's co filmmaker, he was interested. And so they recruited them. They built a loft at the Filmway studio up in 127th Street. They built a, you know, a set that would work with this. And they created their five, uh, sort of five day marijuana semi orgy, uh, you know, of which they got about five in and filmed hours of reels of film and got about five minutes out of it. <laughs> but it does give that flavor of the other world and of it was the era when outcasts when street people like a joe buck the john voight character or a ratso rizzo might have been at a warhol party might absolutely. have absolutely absolutely sure yeah so schlesinger got what he was looking for i think some of the superstars felt a little exploited in the end because they weren't used and andy warhol wrote in his memoirs that he was sorry United Artists didn't give him the money to make a movie about male hustlers because he could have made it much more authentically, which is true, but they weren't looking for authenticity where they were looking for the uh, image of authenticity. Yes, I think, uh, yes, Andy would have been more authentic and a lot duller as well. A uh, question from Mia, which you'll find the whole answer to in uh, Shooting Midnight Cowboy, but you can give her the short answer. How did the filmmakers find the music and the musicians for the soundtrack? Or let's just talk about how they found this, the song that was so vital to its success. I well, think. again, one of Michael Childers' jobs was bringing a bunch of record albums to John Schlesinger as he's trying to figure out what would work first as a sort of temporary track to begin to edit the movie with. An Aerial Ballet by Harry Nielsen is one of these. An Aerial Ballet was a pretty obscure album in those days. Everybody's Talking had, was the only non -written, song not written by Nielsen on it. Didn't do much, uh, you know, hadn't been a big hit or anything. It came out long before the movie came out, right? A year before, John right. loves it, starts cutting the movie to it, loves the enigmatic flavor of it, and decides in the end to stick with it, even though Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell and Leonard Cohen all offer songs, he sticks with everybody's talking. And I think when you look at the movie, it's just so memorable. And again, Chil Mike Childers was heavily involved in getting that started. Maureen has another question that you deal with uh, quite extensively in the book. Is it true that Dustin Hoffman improvised the line, I'm walking here, when he banged on that taxi in Midtown Manhattan? Well, Tell you've asked, that story. You've asked the question exactly right because he improvised the line, the scene, and, and many people have, have suggested over the years, including Dustin, that the, the entire thing of the taxi moving into the crosswalk was a stolen shot that you know, the cab driver was just trying to beat the light and ran into their film. It's shootingly <laughs> unlikely, yeah. Well, in fact, six, <laughs> you know, the, the drafts of the screenplay six, eight months earlier from Wallow South have that moment, but what they don't have is the dialogue. So Hoffman is improvising the dialogue, whether he thought about it before he went into the crosswalk, I don't know, but everybody remembers the line. It is Hoffman's line, it's not in the script. Michael would like to know if you know why Waldo Salt was selected to adapt the novel as opposed to a gay writer or a young, hip counterculture writer. Did Hurley have any suggestions for the adaptation or for the adaptor, excuse well, me? Well, Hurley he had the suggestion that he might want to do it. Right. And they were worried about that since he hadn't written a screenplay. He'd written plays. In fact, he'd written a play that had been on Broadway for six months, Blue Denim, but they didn't feel he was the right person. They went to Gore Vidal. Uh, they went to Truman Capote. Basically, and Gore said, let's record what Gore said. You shouldn't write this into a movie. You should make the city and the pillar into a movie. Yeah, my novel's much better than, Mid <laughs> than this trashy Midnight Cowboy. They, they had trouble finding one who could relate to the novel. And eventually they settled on Jack Gelber, 
uh, who gave them a, a script and a rewrite of a script, but they it didn't do what Schlesinger was looking for, which was to really focus on these two men, Joe Buck and Ratso Rizzo, and the wary partnership that forms. Waldo was brought to them by his agent. Waldo hadn't had a good, hadn't written a good screenplay in years. He'd been blacklisted for 10 years. He had a terrible drinking problem. But Waldo had done some writing uh, about New York and a draft dodger, actually, that his agent, George Lito, took to Jerry Hellman. Jerry thought, well, wait, this has got some of what we're looking for about New York, about this kind of person. He took it to Schlesinger. They were desperate at that point. And then Waldo wrote them a memo about the novel and about what he thought it needed. And it matched up beautifully with Schlesinger's own vision of why he was making this movie in the first place. So they took the chance on Waldo. He was really hard to work with to the extent that he was great in talking ideas, but actual pages, uh, he was very slow at. And Schlesinger and he got into a lot of battles over that, but eventually they pulled through and they were you know, Waldo won best the best screenplay for best adapted screenplay for this script. It is one of the great screenplays. So they were very lucky to get him. He's on the set every day when Voigt and Hoffman are improvising in rehearsal. He's writing this stuff down and taping it and they're putting it into the screenplay. He said it was the best experience he had in his life. It, it rescued his life in many ways. Although I think it's a great screenplay, but I think there are parts of the movie which are almost impossible to understand if you haven't written the novel, especially the flashback scenes to Texas, the rape scene with the girlfriend and so on. It's very hard to know what's really going on there, don't you think, unless you've read the novel beforehand? These are called flash cuts. They were kind yes. of, uh, you know, modern. Uh, the pawnbroker has a number of them. Um, they're designed to be confusing, but at the same time, they're supposed to give you a sense of both the dreamscape and the loneliness of Joe Buck, of the dysfunction at the heart of his life why that is and what it is. And yes, it's confusing for a lot of people. One of my jobs in doing this kind of book, Charles, is to fall in love with the movie. That's my, re that, that's part of the mission. And uh, so I, you know, I get it and I, and I, I would defend it, but nonetheless, it has, it is confusing. It's meant to be a little confusing, but it's meant to put you inside his, his world and his dreams and his life. Well, it succeeds that way. I agree. Uh, question number five, were other actors considered for the roles of Joe Buck and Ratso Rizzo before John Boyd and Dustin Hoffman were chosen? Well, Hoffman, yes. I mean, Schlesinger didn't actually want either of these guys at first. <laughs> he didn't want this movie, new movie star to mess up his movie. But Hoffman had short-circuited the search for Ratso Rizzo by getting dressed in a dirty raincoat and insisting that Schlesinger meet him at Times Square at midnight. And by 5 a.m., Schlesinger had surrendered to this guy who looked exactly like he fitted in. Voight, though, was different. I mean, at first they were very interested and in, kept being interested in a handsome young actor named Michael Sarazen, who was Jacqueline Bizet's boyfriend, Bizet, Bizet. They met him out in Malibu, and Schlesinger thought this was the image that you saw in the novel. And he stuck with him. Uh, Marion Doherty, though, the great casting director, thought that Voight could be the right person for this, that Voight had not only the vulnerability, but also could have that little bit of violence inside him that comes out here and there in the movie. And she pushed hard. They chose Sarazen, they, they outfitted, you know, they, they took Sarazen's measurements and Ann Roth was starting to get to work on the costumes. But Sarazen was signed to another studio that suddenly upped the price. They talked, you know, Hellman and Schlesinger, who were on a shoestring budget, looked at each other. They kept looking at the filmed auditions. They said every time they did, Sarazen looked a little worse and Voigt looked a little better. Voigt worked for $17,500, peanuts in other words. Eventually they went to Voigt and afterwards Schlesinger said, I don't know what the hell I was thinking. Why? <laughs> you know, Because Voigt was fabulous in this movie and Hoffman and Voigt together are two of the great, you know, the great collaborative performances and he gave all credit to Marion Doherty. Hank would like to know if when talking to audiences about this book, have you found any younger LGBTQ people who had no idea how tough it was to be gay at the time that this film came out? Well, I've run into a few former students, yes, who've talked that way about it, who don't know the history. And, and that's typical, not only for LGBTQ, Q students, but for all students, you know, they 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 have short memories. The Vietnam War doesn't doesn't compute for so many students. And yes, they don't, you know. Though I think those who got to see the boys in the band and its new incarnation and other things, and especially with the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, 
a lot of history was being explained. And so for people who are interested in their history and interested in, in where they come from, this was possible. Um, but generally, you know, Midnight Cowboy is a film that some people are still seeing, but I think it's a little bit overlooked these days. And I think there's a whole generation that doesn't know it and that doesn't know how important that era was. And I mean, that's all. My, my nephew, Tom Kaiser, who's a tremendous film freak, and I was shocked that he had never seen The Midnight Cowboy, and he's going to fix that uh, soon. Uh, once again this evening, we are a proud partner with Brooklyn's own community bookstore. And I guarantee all of you that if you buy this book, you're going to have a wonderful experience. And the best way to celebrate it is with Brooklyn's own community bookstore, which is co-hosting this event and has copies available for purchase right now. Michael K., can you say a bit about why John Voight was chosen for this role? Well, we did that already. Okay. I think we've already had that. Um, what was the biggest surprise in your research of all the things that you found out either about the movie or the era? What was the biggest surprise for you, Glenn? Well, I think we've touched on it a bit. Um, I came to Columbia University in 1967. Um, Columbia was one of the first universities to have a gay society, you know, society form there and be recognized, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. That's right. That was the first one that I know of, yes. And, and so, you know, I was surprised at the level of homophobia in liberal institutions, in the New York Times, for example, in Harper's Magazine, and this gets a little beyond our story, but in 1970, the Joe Epstein cover story in Harper's that, you know, was just as ugly and, and vicious as possible, and that uh, and then have that story defended after uh, gay protesters showed up by defended by Willie Morris and the, and the editorial. Willie Morris, the great Southern liberal who published yeah. the most disgusting putting on homosexuality ever. Yeah, the I, author I, said, if I could wish homosexuality off the face of the earth, I would. Well, it inspired, as you know, a wonderful essay by Merle Miller that ran in the New York Times Magazine and was really groundbreaking there about- Miraculous, it was a miraculous piece. It was a miraculous piece for me who was a junior at uh, Columbia trying to figure out if I was gay or not and what it would mean if I was. And Merrill Miller's piece was the first encouraging thing that I'd ever read in a newspaper ever. Probably the first encouraging thing on this subject ever published in a newspaper actually. Well, it was shocking that you would think there would have been more empathy uh, again, in liberal New York, in, in the liberal media, and it wasn't there at all. And, and it's, it's partly the psychological community. It's many things that contributed to that. But that was my biggest surprise. And then I found myself in all this territory that I knew so little about. Um, and I had the great opportunity not only to meet you and interview you, but Christopher Brown, the novelist, and, you know, and, and a number of other people who helped me not only understand the history, but live the history. I mean, we're all the, roughly the same age. We've all been through this time. And uh, the great joy of, for me of doing a book like this is to learn a whole bunch of things I didn't know and to be able to, to use that in order to explain the era and the movie. Again, a movie explains the era, an era explains the movie. I, I, it really worked well for me, but it was pretty shocking to see what people were saying. <laughs> And then. Sunday, Bloody Sunday, Spazing Your Sex movie was partly autobiographical. Was the character of the doctor and was somehow uh, based on Schlesinger himself? Hadn't he been in a relationship with a man who was also sleeping with a woman at the same exactly. time? Exactly. It wasn't as traumatic. It wasn't as life affirming or as, as uh, involving of John's life as it was for this doctor in the movie. But that was definitely a situation that he adapted for his needs. Like any good filmmaker, he took the material from his own life and the Jewish background that this is a Jewish doctor. And so in John's relationship with his own Jewish family, um, a lot of that's reflected here. And the wonderful scene in the movie where, you know, a, a relative comes up to this Jewish doctor to say, why aren't you married yet? I Let me introduce you to Elizabeth over here or, you know, Esther, you know, and, and he handles it very well with a plum. But, you know, that kind of thing that John was quite used to, I think, in his own life. Uh, it's how, so, how accepting was John's family of his homosexuality? His parents were very accepting of it. They were very sophisticated, uh, well-educated people, affluent people. They were worried about his future because he seemed so up and down. That, you know, his insecurities and his, 
his, his, he was kind of a, a fearful child and uh, they didn't see him buckling down to anything. He's a guy who grew up in front of them. So they were constantly chiding him about that and worried about him. Uh, but they, the, 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 his sexual orientation was not at the heart of their concerns. It was just, how is our oldest son really gonna find his way in the world? And he does, he does. It was, it was the, you know, we're talking about there was no sympathy for homosexuals. The fact was that until 1973, it was the official policy of the American Psychiatric Association that unless you were trying to becoming, come straight, you were a sick homosexual. And that was only changed in part because of a campaign led by Frank Kameny, the great father of the gay movement in our time. And he led a political campaign really to convince the APA to remove homosexuality from its list of disorders uh, four years after Midnight Cowboy came out. And that was the event which really made all of our subsequent progress possible. Because until then, uh, people like Abe Rosenthal, who were the editor of the New York Times, were perfectly comfortable in asserting and having their reporters assert in their articles that the only healthy homosexuals were the ones who were be trying to become heterosexual. Well, that's exactly Joe Epstein's point in this piece in Harper's. I mean, because if it's, if it's something you acquire, therefore you can be cured of it. And if you can be cured of it and you refuse to be cured of it, you refuse to go under, then something's really wrong with you and you're a danger to everyone else because it's a contagious disease. It's an extraordinary, again, the conventional wisdom had no basis in anything approaching research um, it just confirmed it was, it was prejudice disguised as science, as Frank yeah. Hammond put it. In fact, he Frank sat down and read all the psychiatric literature, and he said, "If there was anything real there, I was perfectly willing to accept it, but it was just garbage in, garbage out." Yeah, an extraordinary contribution. All right, well, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you so much, Glenn, for this wonderful conversation. Thank you to the Center for Brooklyn History. Please buy this book from your local bookstore, the community bookstore. I promise you you'll have a fabulous time reading it. Thank you all for joining us this evening.